Hey, hello again, everybody, and welcome to another edition of First and North, where we talk all things NFC North, and we've got a lot to talk about. Week six is now behind us. Week seven coming up. We are going to recap. We are going to preview. We've got it all coming your way as we hit each of the cities in the NFC North. My name is Dan Miller. I'm in Detroit. We cover the Lions. We've got Tim Van Voren, who joins us from Fox Milwaukee. It is great to have Tim with us this week. We've got Ahmad Hicks from Fox Minneapolis. He covers the Vikings. And we got Lou Canellas from Fox Chicago. He covers the Bears, so we will talk all things Chicago coming up. Two games involving the NFC North in week six. We had the Vikings facing the Bears, so a divisional matchup. We had the Lions taking on the Bucks. Green Bay had the week off. There's news there as well. We'll talk about that. Ahmad, let me start with you because you won that divisional matchup. Look, you won it 19-13. Wasn't always pretty, but it doesn't have to be. It's a victory, and that's all that counts. What was the talk coming out of it? Well, the talk is they won a game that they should have won. Now they're focused on going to go win a game that no one expects them to win. Only 70% of Americans think the 49ers will win that game, and only 30% think the Vikings will win. So, I mean, you know, the team is high. They're optimistic, as they have been in previous weeks. One player told me earlier this week when we were sitting down chatting, he said, we got the one we're supposed to. Now we're about to go shock the world on Monday night. So the optimism is high. The mood is good inside the Vikings locker room right now as the guys have an extra day of rest. But I'm not taking too much from that game. They beat a team that is probably one of the worst in the NFL. So take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> All right, well, we'll let Lou talk about that in a second. I know Lou doesn't like hearing that, but let me ask you first. Look, you, you were without <laughs> probably the best receiver in the NFL in Justin Jefferson. Third down was a problem, two for 15, uh -huh. one offensive touchdown. Is that sustainable for the Vikings? Can you live without Jefferson and try to make something out of this season? How difficult will that be? No, absolutely not. That's not sustainable. And head coach Kevin O'Connell, that's something that he talked about in his Monday press conference. This team has to find an identity in the rushing attack. I mean, they're averaging under 100 yards per game. I don't even think one rusher has eclipsed the 100 yard mark this season. So they had, have to get the ground game running because we all know this is a pass first team. But if you can't run the ball, you can't stay on the field to throw the football. So moving forward, it will be really hard without Justin Jefferson. But that's head coach Kevin O'Connell's job. You got to be creative. You got to get other guys the ball. TJ Hawkinson especially. And this team needs to stop dropping the football. They lead, they're second in the NFL right now with drops with 11 just behind the can. Kansas City Chiefs so drop passes certainly don't help this offense. All right, Lou, we love Ahmad, but but he's saying what a lot of people are saying about your Bears. So let me just give you the floor. It's another tough week in Chicago. Oh, I'll tell you what, Ahmad, the truth hurts. I know we're ugly. We can't help it. <laughs> just when we thought we were going to, you know, pretty ourselves up a little bit and maybe turn things around coming off a, a, a fine offensive performance against the Broncos despite the loss and then Wow, a 40 to 20 pasting of the Commodores and uh, Commanders, excuse me, in, in Washington. I had Lionel Mirichi on my mind. Uh, we just look, we, revert, we reverted back to our old ways. We look like we did against the Chiefs. And against the Chiefs is one thing against the Vikings, who came in with one victory. Uh, that's another thing. I don't know where to start, guys. I mean, this is a Bears franchise. They have not won a home game in well over a year. Uh, they haven't won a divisional game in their last 10. And they actually just, they didn't look good at all against Minnesota on Sunday. At home, you thought they had the momentum. And sure enough, we just saw a lot of what we've seen throughout the year. Justin Fields, poor game plan, no rollouts, no RPOs for Fields to make him feel comfortable out there. Fields couldn't go through his progressions quick enough. He ends up getting hurt in this football game. Ironically, he gets pulled down and sacked by Daniil Hunter on a, on a sack, on a play that he actually had six seconds to throw the football. So he had more than enough time even to throw it out of bounds. It's the same old story here in Chicago. And at one and five, I mean, unfortunately, fans in this town are now being realistic. It appears as though Fields is going to take a seat for this game. Ended up injuring his thumb, dislocating the right thumb. Not sure yet if he'll be able to play, but head coach Matt Eberflew said yesterday, that it was doubtful he'd be able to go on Sunday against the Raiders. So now we're going with undrafted free agent quarterback Tyson Bajant in this town. And by the way, guys, this will be, if Bajant starts, the 29th different starting quarterback for the Bears since 2000. No wonder we can't get it going offensively. 
I, you know what? I, I thought you were going to come at me with a different number. I thought you were going to say, like, since the Bears won the Super Bowl or something like that. Lou, since 2000? And, and, and I guess the problem with that is that there's a lot of questions as to whether or not they even have their guy now when the hope was when they drafted Fields that, in fact, they did. But that's very much up in the air, right? I'll tell you what. Yeah, it's going to be the topic of discussion from now until the end of the football season. And, frankly, Dan, probably from now – until the 2024 NFL draft in April. What should the Bears do? Caleb Williams wasn't far from Chicago, about 90 minutes in South Bend this past Saturday. So all Bears fans were watching the Notre Dame USC game. And for those of you that saw that contest, Williams suffered maybe his worst game as a college quarterback. He did not look like a Heisman Trophy winner. So now those fans who thought Caleb Williams would be the Messiah, the answer, the Bears ended up with the number one pick. Remember, they have their own, and they have winless Carolinas, so the chances look pretty good through six weeks. Now some of those fans are off the Williams bandwagon saying, uh, maybe we go with the quarterback at North Carolina instead, or there's a full crop of good quarterbacks coming out following this college football season. Maybe Tyson Bajan's the guy. Who knows? It looks as though we will at least see if Beijing can start to play on this level. Came into the football game third quarter after Fields got hurt on Sunday against Minnesota. Couple of bad rookie mistakes. One, you can't blame him. I mean, he had just been thrown into the baptism of fire out there. But he came back. He's a confident kid. Came back and led the team on a nine-play, 77-yard drive for a touchdown later in the football game. Many thought that he'd lead this, lead this Bears team to victory. Didn't happen, but again, we are already looking ahead to 2024 in this town. All right, so I'm going to get to Tim in a second, but just let me come back and touch on something <laughs> that you touched on there, Lou, and that is the draft because we in Detroit know what that life is. You're living a life that we have, you know, been through, uh, embraced at times. When we had the Rams' first-round pick, everybody's favorite team in Detroit was the Lions. Second favorite team and maybe favorite team was whoever was playing the Rams. So has it become in Chicago in vogue to root for whoever is playing against Carolina? Because you guys will benefit big time. Oh, 100%. I mean, we are watching that game here in Chicago. You've got the Bears <laughs> on one TV, Bears-Vikings. You've got Dolphins and Carolina on the other team, on the other TV, and you're asking yourself, wait, 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 wait. Panthers are up 14-0. This can't be happening to the Bears and Bears fans. But we know what happened. Miami ended up waking up and winning that football game. Thankfully, the Bears have Carolina on the schedule at this point. I guess we win either way. If the Bears lose, Ooh. we win. If the Panthers lose, we win again in this town. So, yeah, we are cheering for every single team that plays Carolina. Wouldn't it be something <laughs> if the Bears ended up with the two top picks in the 2024 NFL Draft? I'm just trying to figure out where everybody's allegiances will lie when you guys actually play Carolina. I mean, is it, do, do you go out there and actively try to lose that game? Just kidding, Roger Goodell. I know they would never do that, but that would be something else. All right, Tim, you got a weekend off. The Packers got a week to get healthy, which for, in their case is probably pretty important at this point. So just what was the talk for Green Bay during that bye week as you got a chance to kind of sit back and watch everybody else play? Well, the Packers weren't the first Midwesterners to slink out of Las Vegas and uh, count their losses and have to regroup. Uh, so that, that's definitely the situation that they were in. It was a disappointing offensive performance. They've had a few of these now. They've been trending downward. So that's what they're trying to work on more than anything else. There's a lot of heat in, in the Packer area about uh, defensive coordinator. We've heard Joe Barry's job status be called into question really since last offseason. But if you look at it defensively, the Packers, other than the Lions game, have played okay. They've held most opponents down. That was the case against the Raiders on, uh, on the game in uh, Las Vegas as well. And the offense just hasn't been able to score points, particularly in the first half of games. So that's job one for Matt LaFleur, who's an offensive coach. Get this team to start out and get on the scoreboard. I personally think Jordan Love is pressing when you watch him. He, the uh, interception at the end of the Vegas game, it looks like he figures that if I don't get it to the end zone, I'm sure, not sure we can get all the way there. That's the way this Packer team looks right now. And, guys, I, I just I had not gotten enough of a fix of bad offense, so I went to the Badger-Iowa game on Saturday. So I have really been confronted oh, with struggles goodness. lately on the football field. 
Yeah, hopefully you got overtime pay for that or at least, you know, some sort of hazard pay for having to watch all that. Listen, Aaron Jones is obviously a big part of what they want to do. You want to help a young quarterback, you give him a running attack. He's one of the most explosive players in the NFL when he's right. Do we have any indication? Is he going to get back to 100% at some point, or is this something that's just going to nag him throughout the year? Uh, you know, the Packers definitely hope so. Matt LaFleur said, I sure hope so. And uh, he's looked good in practice. He's come back. The thing of it is, they thought he was going to play in the Las Vegas game, and he tweaked the hamstring a little bit the weekend before, and he was trying to do therapy even in the pool out there try, in Vegas, trying to get back out on the field for Monday night. So they know he's their number one playmaker offensively, and their team looks a lot different without him. Luke could tell you, week one, Aaron Jones was all over the place against that Bears defense, and the Packer offense yeah. has really missed him since. And defenders now are saying, okay, we're going to come up. We're not going to give you any cushion on the outside. We're not going to give your first and second year wide receivers or your rookie tight ends any cushion. They're going to have to get open against us, and they haven't been able to. So Jordan Love is looking around like, where do I go? And we're seeing that reflected in the offensive ineffectiveness. Hey, Tim, can I I jump in for a second because I was doing some reading here in Chicago. There's no chance that the Packers would trade Aaron Jones. I know he's coming up on 30 years of age, and there's the potential that, you know, there are some in Green Bay and Lambeau land who feel like, you know what, the season's a wash. Let's just look ahead to the future. It's already the youngest roster in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken. They wouldn't move a guy like Jones, would they, to Kansas City or Buffalo or even Cincinnati? That doesn't seem out of the Packer playbook. I agree with you. We've seen uh, some speculation about that, but I don't think so. Aaron Jones is really uh, the face of this franchise in a lot of ways right now. He took less money to stay in Green Bay uh, coming into this season. And while a lot of fans and, and those of us observers right now are saying, boy, they're losing these close games, this is exactly what we all talked about in the offseason for this year in Green Bay. They're young. They're going to be in a lot of close games. They're probably going to lose some of those close games. That's exactly what's happened through five games for the Packers so far this year. So I don't think they rip up the sheets of paper and change everything around. I think this is their course of action, and I'd be stunned if Aaron Jones isn't with them all year. I think that's a great thread, so let's pull that here for each of the teams because we've heard rumors about Minnesota that we touched on last week. And I wonder, I'll get to you in a second, Lou, about anybody Chicago might dump off. But in Detroit, there, there were some NFL talking head throwing out the possibility, would Detroit trade for Daniil Hunter? Ahmad, is Minnesota still playing this thing to win it? Or do you think with the trade deadline coming up in less than two weeks, that they could be a player that might start selling off a little bit here. Well, Dan, if they would have lost this game last week to the Bears, I think they would have been big players at the trade deadline. But if you look at their schedule coming up, the hardest teams are behind them right now. They have a lot of divisional games coming up. They have some weaker opponents and the Broncos, the Raiders and uh, the Saints and teams like that. So there's, like I said earlier, a lot of optimism for this team. These guys said all they need is one win to get that momentum rolling. And they know they started what they wanted to do with winning in the division with that game versus the Bears. And they all believe if they can win in their division, they can clinch the division and repeat as NFC North champs. So I don't think this team is in a state where they want to start giving up players or giving in on the season. I think they want to win some games, get Justin Jefferson back, and then see what they can do in the final three weeks of the season when they take on the Lions twice in the final three weeks. All right, we'll see what happens there. As you said, they got a tough one, which we're going to talk about coming up against San Francisco. Look, uh, Lou Bears, what's the talk? You've already talked to people are talking about draft. Is there anybody that it would make sense to sell off in Chicago? Well, you know, we're loaded with draft capital now. I mean, this is something that in these parts we have not had over the last couple of years. And with it looking like potentially maybe the first two picks in next year's draft, uh, the Bears could be in a position where they could start wheeling and dealing. I'd love to see this franchise here in Chicago make some type of offer. If Daniil Hunter ended up becoming uh, someone that the Vikings put on the trade block, he would fit in perfect. It'd fit in perfectly anywhere. Guy that's leading the NFL with eight sacks. But the Bears are a team in desperate need of a pass rusher, desperately. And I'd rather see them spend a second or third round pick, maybe a second and a fifth like it cost them for, like they got for Roquan Smith, for a Daniil Hunter instead of, okay, let's roll the dice. Hopefully we get a pass rusher out of the 2024 draft. In regards to someone that they might deal, Dan, between now and what the deadline is two weeks from today on Halloween, really Jalen Johnson is the one guy that I think brings some cachet and might be uh, someone sure. that may draw interest from other teams out there. The problem with Johnson is he just hasn't really been a guy that's forced turnovers over the course of his career. And 
Typically, you'd like to see a cornerback go out there and whether it's interceptions or forcing fumbles like Peanut Tillman did for so many great years as a Bear. Uh, we have not seen Jalen Johnson do either. Terrific uh, on-ball cover man, but I'm not sure he's a guy that's going to bring back much in return. And at some point in this town, this team needs to start creating some type of winning environment. I mean, they have gone 4-19 and under their head coach, Matt Eberflus. This is pathetic. And at some point, they have to learn how to win and win together. And I think keeping Jalen Johnson here in Chicago with what they start to build this year and next year with those draft picks, I think that's the right move. I'd hate to see them dra uh, trade away a Jalen Johnson. Look, we've been through a lot of regimes that have not worked in Detroit, and we've been through a lot of regimes that had draft capital and it didn't work out. Is there faith in Chicago that, that Ryan Poles is the right guy, that, that all this draft capital in his hands is a good thing? That's a great question. Um, I would have said absolutely he was a guy that would be around for another few years, giving him the chance to rebuild this roster. But, you know, he's made some good moves and some bad moves. Justin Fields was not his draft pick. That was a draft pick made by Ryan Pace in the old regime. So he will not really take responsibility for the Fields pick if they so choose to move on from a Justin Fields. Uh, he did make some mistakes. The Roquan Smith trade, not sure that was the right move. The Chase Claypool deal, an awful move. This franchise gave up the 32nd pick in the draft for a Chase Claypool who is now in Miami, who they basically gave away. He did make the trade with Carolina, found a team out there to trade the first pick in the draft with, who he thought foresaw having a tough year this year. And the Panthers, sure enough, at least through the first six games, have had a difficult time of it. So he's made some good moves, some bad moves. There will be more people in this town that will tell you they need to make a change with their head coach than they need to make a change with their general manager. But if you're going to make a change with the head coach, do you allow yeah. this GM to bring in another head coach? Or do you finally in this town, which has rarely happened over the last decade, bring in a new GM, give him the chance to make his own or bring in his own head coach and coaching staff, and then use that top pick in the draft, maybe top two picks in the draft, and have it all together? It hasn't happened in these parts in a long time. Yeah, I will tell you, it, it reminds me a little bit of, of what we had here in Detroit where they gave Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn an extra year. And that year was the Jeff Okuda draft when they picked number three. It was a quarterback-rich draft with Justin Herbert and Tua where it might have set the franchise in a different direction. Letting a general manager stay a year too long if he's not the right guy can be really costly. And I think that's something, obviously, they'll have to weigh in Chicago. Uh, it, it's tough because you want to trust, you want to believe that the people that you hire can get the job done. But, man, if you're sitting there with one and two or one and three or two and three or whatever it is, you better have the right guy in place because that is a franchise-changing opportunity that Chicago may have coming up in this draft. Let, let me get to you, Tim, and, and Jordan Love. And, look, two and one record, took on the Lions. He was terrific. He, he had thrown seven touchdown passes, one interception. Since then, I think it's five interceptions, one touchdown. Things haven't gone as well. That's life with a young quarterback. But I assume in Green Bay the faith is still there, that he's the guy. And, and I know that faith doesn't always go in a straight line. But just thoughts on where he is right now and enduring being a young quarterback in this league. Uh, in answer to your general question there, I do think, yes, the faith is still there in Green Bay within the organization in Jordan Love. This is his first year as a starter after three years of sitting out. Well, Aaron Rodgers, basically the same situation. In his first year as a starter, the Packers did come up with a contract extension for him right around Halloween. They felt they had seen enough in half a season and the previous seasons when he hadn't played to commit to Aaron Rodgers. We shall see what the feeling is regarding Jordan Love in terms of actual money being out there. Love is under contract for one more season based on what the Packers did with him this past offseason. So there is belief in Jordan Love. It, you would like to see more progress than you've seen. Again, it started well this year and it's gone the wrong way, but that's kind of a young quarterback. And as I said earlier, he hasn't had a lot around him offensively. So that appears to be where the Packers are with this. You talk about the 29 different quarterbacks uh, in Chicago. In Green Bay, that, it, that's just a foreign concept. Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers. Now the idea is Jordan Love 
for a considerable amount of time, and I don't think that that plan has changed anything. Yeah, to, to your point, uh, and what we talked about earlier, getting Aaron Jones back, Christian Watson missing time, then coming back, being healthy. I mean, in his defense, having those guys out there is what this team is designed. I mean, they built this team to be around him, and he really hasn't had that to this point. I, I think that's exactly right. Very astute, Dan. You've seen the Packers in person. You know that that's what their offense looks like right now. And you, as a Packer organization, did not go out and get an experienced tight end or an experienced wide receiver to offset all this youth. You're talking about young skill position players, first or second year players at wide receiver, every single one on the roster, rookies at tight end. All those guys are rookies other than Josiah DeGuara, who's been in the league a little bit. So you're talking about, aside from Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, looking at people who are all learning on the job along with Jordan Love. And the offensive line has not been the strength they expected it to be in this off, uh, coming into the season. Number one, you lose David Bakhtiari now. He's out for the rest of the year. He played that first game against Chicago and played well. So you subtract a player of his level. They've been kind of mix, mixing and matching on that offensive line. It just hasn't been what they wanted to give Jordan Love for a full evaluation. Certainly there's a responsibility on Love as well. Turning the football over is the, the biggest uh, negative you can have as an NFL quarterback, and Jordan Love has done too much of that in the last couple of weeks. If he were to manage the game, maybe not be all exciting, but get some, something done and going down the field, you can win some football games. And they did that against the yeah. New Orleans Saints without being real flashy, but he won that game with a fourth quarter comeback. So now the Packers basically, I think, are going to want him to Again, rely on Aaron Jones, go with some other options offensively, and just don't beat yourself on that side of the ball. The Packers thought this was their soft spot of the schedule, and it is with Denver coming up this week, but they thought the Raider game, their previous game, was the start of all that. Yeah, I mean, it's the life in this league. You go like this. When you win, like Ahmad and the Vikings got to win, everybody feels good, and you feel like you're ascending at that point. You lose, and it's like, what's wrong? Make changes, and, and it's it's the life that they live, and it's the life that we live here in covering these teams. Look, Ahmad, Minnesota, we know the story. It was so good last year in one-score games. Is there a feeling there that this team is, is still – as talented, I know the faces have changed and they've lost some guys, but the breaks aren't necessarily going their way early in the year. And if they can just change a play here or there, this thing turns around quickly. Yeah, when you look at their roster and you're thinking to yourself, this team should be as good as they were last year. But the fact of the matter is they're not, although all of their offensive pieces are returned except for Dalvin Cook. I don't know what it is with this offense. Kevin O'Connell talked about it the other day. They cannot sustain efficient drives. They just hurt themselves, whether it's first down drops, not being able to extend the drive or consistently playing behind the chains and facing third and long situations versus the Bears last week. They were two for 13 on third down conversions. So so if you want to say, oh, this team is still good, they can do better. Well, they didn't display anything to be optimistic or positive about versus one of the league's worst, as we said earlier. And then defensively, I mean, sometimes they can stop the run. Sometimes they can't. Tim, we might have to give you back Dean Lowry that we got from the Packers because he's been a complete no show for this team this year. I think only five combined tackles uh, through six games. So, I mean, it, it's a lot of holes on this team, not just offensively, but defensively. Defense has gotten a lot better. They were one of the worst in the NFL last year. They've improved. They're middle of the road defense this year, but that's still not saying a lot because this defense is not good. They can't stop a nosebleed, and the San Francisco 49ers are averaging 148 yards on the ground, so it does not matter if Christian McCaffrey's there, Jermichael Hasty, Elijah Mitchell, or me running the football. They will be successful behind that offensive line, so the Vikings have their work cut out for them. I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that us Detroiters got to enjoy a trip down to Florida this past week, 80 degree weather and a victory over the box to run the record to five and one. And it look, it was one of those games that was kind of grinded out. It was three, three deep into the second quarter and the Lions made a couple plays, got up, made another play. Jamison Williams, which was huge to see for folks around here because they've been waiting for him to live to deliver. And he did big time with a, a touchdown catch of 45 yards and the Lions get a victory. Now, 3-0 on the road, which is, you know, living pretty well in this league. And the Lions have done a good job away from home and had tremendous support. As you saw in Green Bay, it was the same type of scene down in Tampa with the sea of blue down there. So, obviously, people are feeling very good about the way things are going here. Not so good. David Montgomery injured in that game. 
Looks like he's going to be down for a while. So the Lions, it looks like Jameer Gibbs will be back. They may be leaning on the rookie coming up here as they get set to go this week in Baltimore and what could be a tough game. We're going to talk about that one coming up. So injuries have been a story in Detroit. They've been able to weather the storm, but they have lost a number of guys. This week they should get Gibbs back. This week they should get Brian Branch back, who has been a great story as a rookie for this team. So they're hoping that as a couple of guys have gone out, missing two offensive linemen this past week, that they'll be able to get some guys back in. But that's just the story in this league. Nobody feels sorry for you. you got to load up and go. Next man up. The whole cliche. You know how that works. Hey, Dan, you let me move. jump in I for a second. Dan, let me ask go you ahead. a question about the Lions. Because, you know, at the beginning of this season, I, thought, I felt that Detroit was the cream of the crop in the NFC North, uh, the best team by far. And sure enough, they're proving that at least through the first six games. Boy, if they win one more and they get off to a 6-1 and one start, if I'm not mistaken, that's the best start in the Super Bowl era for the Lions, going back to 66. Is that correct? Well, it's been a while, yeah. I mean, this is the first 5-1 and one start we've had since 2011, and then you had to go back significantly before that. And they've also won four consecutive games by 14 points or more. There's all sorts of numbers that you can throw out. It's the first time they've done that since the early 60s. Wow. So, yeah, this, they're, they're historically doing things that this franchise hasn't done in a while. And, and you know what? It's been impressive, and I think there is, we've talked about some trepidation when you looked at this team saying, okay, how good are they? Can you trust them because of things that we've seen in the past? And the fact of the matter is they're a top 10 defense, a top 10 offense. Jared Goff, if you look at what he's done over the last 17 games, he has been tremendous. They're 13-4 and four over the last 17 games. Uh, they've won on the road. They've won at home. They're just doing things we haven't seen a Lions team do in a long time. And it's not just, you know, the winning. It's the way they're winning. And, and it's not just, you know, Matthew Stafford as it was for so long, dragging them down the field and finding a way to win in the end. It's just flat beating other teams. It's demonstrably being the best team on the field on a given Sunday. And they've been doing that. So, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to like here. And we're seeing these power polls come out. And the Lions are ranked in the top five in the NFL fell in the top three in the NFC with San Francisco and Philadelphia. I think it's earned and I think it's deserved and I, and I think they've done a heck of a job and, and they've done it through some injuries where they've been missing some guys. Uh, we'll see if they could keep it going this 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 week and we'll talk about the Baltimore game coming up it is going to be a very tough one. The Ravens are good. They're at home. The Lions will be on the road again where as I said they've done a nice job so far but this Ravens team they're top 10 in, in, in uh, defense top 10 in offense and I think it's going to be a heck of a test for them. So look. It's exciting around here. I'm telling you, this city is lit up for the Lions like I have not seen it in my 27 years in Detroit. And, and people are believing in this. They're sinking their teeth into it. They're loving this head coach. They're loving this general manager. They're loving these players. It is a fun time to be a Lions fan. Yeah, for good reason. And, you know, I just saw yesterday, I, there are some prognosticators, experts out there who feel that the Lions may even be better than the Eagles. And that when you're looking at power rankings in the NFC, that San Francisco won and that Detroit's two. You agree? No, I, I said what I needed to say. I stated in my case, you know, I think it just starts with offensive and defensive lines. And I think you guys have one of the best groups in the National Football League. Uh, that certainly helps you win a lot of games. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. And that's how this team was constructed. That offensive line is the face of this team. Now, they're missing a couple guys, so that makes it a little more difficult. But they have put big-time assets. There's three number one draft picks up there, a, a pro bowler who was a mid-round draft pick, and a, and a high-priced free agent in Vitae that they have put into that line. This team is built to protect Jared Goff, to run the football, to give Jared Goff play action passes. And the key thing is all that is working, but the key thing for Detroit is now that defense has come along. Where it has been 30 of 31st, 32nd for years, this year now they're getting it done. And really the second half of last year where they started to play well. So, yeah, and Lou, it sounded like you wanted to jump in there. There's a lot of good things happening, but the key thing is it's not just the offense, which has been the story of Detroit for a long time. It's all three phases. Lou, let me come to you because one of the things that, that always worries me in the NFL is when I see teams go out and spend huge money in free agency, which is what the Bears did this past offseason. As you look at the guys that they brought in, are they regretting some of that spending? I know the record is what the record is, but guys can play well outside of that. Is there some regret to that big 
the you know, amount of money bag they threw around this past offseason? No regret. And as we look ahead to the game on Sunday, real quickly, I'm still going to take the Bears in this game against the Raiders who are coming to Chicago because I feel like the defense is starting to come together. And that's, Dan, where they spent the bulk of their dollars this past offseason, especially at linebacker with Tremaine Edmonds and T.J. Edwards and up front. I feel like the Bears defense is coming together. Ahmad touched on it briefly about in regards to the game last week against the Vikings where the Bears had uh, held Minnesota to two yards rushing um, per, per rush. I think the Bears defense is coming around and I think that defensively the Bears are going to put together a strong effort on Sunday against the Raiders and end up winning this football game even with the undrafted rookie Tyson Bajan from Shepherd College at quarterback. Shepherd. Hey, it's, it's the uh, production school for quarterbacks. Shepard will become famous if they win that game. Uh, Minnesota taking on San Francisco. Green Bay taking on the Broncos. Lions taking on Baltimore. All things we'll recap next week on First and North. Guys, appreciate it. Everybody out there, thank you for your time. Thank you for making us a part of your day. NFC North rolls on into week seven, and we will see you next week.